five, four. I'm on the flower. Okay. Bring it. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to Juma Game Reserve. Welcome to a fantastic morning here in South Africa. My name is Mark and Brian and Thumb joining me this morning on the vehicle. Vim is in final control. Well, who's Thumb today? Sleepy Thumb. Oh, Sleepy Thumb. <laughs> With a bit of fluff. fluff. thought we'd start off with a really beautiful flower. It's not going to be out for long. It'll be gone in two days time. In fact, today it's, bl it's blooming full today. And by the end of today, they'll already start wilting. As you can see, it's a lily. It's a crinum lily. Um, crinum is actually, as far as I know, the Greek word for lily. And uh, so many different common names, grass lily, flay lily, river lily, a bunch of different crinums. This particular one, I'm not too sure. It could be bulby spermum, bulby spermum, something like that, which literally means bulbous seed, because the, the seeds are in these big pots. Follow up. And when we have something like this, it's nice to see how things My guess is that there might be cat up on Sydney's dam, the big dam on Whistlesook. And it's certainly something to investigate. Although one, by the time we about an hour will have passed since we came in the gate. Strange how this mist has rolled in. It's rather unusual. But it's a change, it's different. It's, hmm. Fortunately, not too thick a mist that it's clouding up the lens too quickly, because sometimes that can happen. tracks coming down the road. So hyena have been visiting where the kill is, but I was just looking at some big tracks that cross the road here. Uh, this pathway, there's hyena as well. Okay, so coming out onto Sandy Patch now, we might get a nice view of the west. Well, the mist not much of a view of the west, but at least we get a little bit of a view over the tree line. Where ordinarily we can see as far as the mountains. Right now we can't see more than a couple of hundred yards in this mist. One bolter up ahead, two.
looking a little bit draggled, I guess it's because of the the amount of dew and, and, and moisture that must have precipitated overnight. Precipitation, there's the... These are white-backed vultures. Let me rephrase that, these are very optimistic white-backed vultures. And after, th where are we now? Four days at least, I think. Since Alex saw these lion kill the buffalo. I'm losing track. Okay. So a little bit puffed up. Oh, that's not good. Yeah, it's Wendy's. Just picked up something in the road. That's actually Wendy's. Oh, it's a Nellis. Comes from this vehicle. And. I actually pulled the mounting out. That's the sway bar. It's, I guess it's just all the. The articulation is actually just a sway bar that hangs the plate that holds the petrol tank. So we've got some work to do perhaps a bit later, but we've lost one of the bolts. That's interesting. Although the sway bar isn't that vital to the kind of driving that we're doing. Basically what it does is it sort of it keeps the axle and it just keeps the rear of the vehicle in line, especially I suppose at speeds on highways more than the amount of driving that we do. Luckily the lion didn't see me get out of the car. If they're still here. Big if. Vulture is a hooded vulture. That means that maybe they're still on the ground because oh, and there's something's been dragged across the road. A lot of hyena tracks. And my guess is that ah, there you go. Piece of the rib cage. The drag marks on the road here. So hyena have gotten to it overnight. There's a piece of vertebra and rib cage. It just looks like a dead twig. Oh, I can't see that. I'm looking for it on the monitor. But that was obviously dragged across the road. It must have been a lot bigger than that at the time because of the drag marks. And hyena have had quite a bit of it. I'm surprised there isn't a vulture on it. There's nothing nearby. And here's yeah, some more rib bones. There is a vulture feeding inside. A lot of hyena tracks. I think. These cats might have moved on, actually. Um, rib cage just ahead of it. Displaced the one that was there. Three of them trying to fit on one 
little dead twig. So already this carcass is starting to be spread out a little bit. I guess the hyena must have, there are a lot of hyena tracks on the road. The hyena must have been able to get in here last night because quite clearly I think the lion have left the scene of the crime. So squeeze in here a little bit, maybe just poke our nose in and have a look. There's a little bit too close. A little grotesque, I guess, in a sense. Those lumbar vertebra and the ribs. Okay. In time, there won't be any sign of the field here, other than maybe a few bones lying around that'll get bleached by the sun. And much the same way as the areas where we've seen buffalo kills before here on Zuma, we go past them. I look at the bones, some of the bones that are lying around, and I can remember those kills vividly. Two little testiculars in this buffalo thorn. Yep. Okay, I'm going to ride up Boyatella Access Road a little way. There's been elephant that's come past here too. Big elephant tracks in the road. But he must have been here yesterday because all the hyena tracks are on top of this elephant's tracks. He was Heading sort of northwest, heading up the access road away from Buyatela. Interesting to see where the boys went now, because they have. It would seem that they finally left this location. My guess is that they probably went up towards the big dam at Bifflesook, on the corner of Bifflesook. And that might have been why we heard monkeys shouting there this morning. I thought perhaps there might have been a leopard up there, but my guess is that... Judging by the, the intensity and the, the, the type of shouting the monkeys, there were only two monkeys calling really. And monkeys are always in a fairly large troop, or well, not always, but generally. And they tend to be a lot more aggressive, a lot more vocal when it comes to a leopard as opposed to lion. Lion are not that much of a threat to monkeys. It's kind of difficult for lion to get hold of a monkey. But monkeys will still throw verbal abuse at them. And the cats didn't come up this way, so they might have headed up Sandy Patch North going to Biffles of Cut Line. So I think we should go that way. Vultures, the reason why they're still hanging around, although there's not really that much left, is because of this mist. And oh. 
Thank you. VM, just letting me know that Twitter's working a bit slow this morning. Maybe you want to send things. If you have any questions, send them to questions at wildearth.tv. .tv, not .com. If Twitter's not too functional this morning. So, what was I saying? I forgot. The vault is in the mist. Oh, the vault is in the mist. Thank you. I've got a brain like this. So <laughs> and it just... I'll get back to that shortly while a question comes in. Good morning, Sharon. Sharon is in Memphis, Tennessee. Walking in Memphis. with my feet 10 feet off a bill. So Memphis, Sharon, wanting to know if there's any jackal in the area. Certainly hyena that have come around. No jackal here immediate in this immediate vicinity, to my knowledge. Not to say that they can't be here. We have seen some jackal up on the airstrip at Arethusa and I think maybe we can try and get there at some stage. The only time that I've been there it's been quite sunny and jackal during the day will invariably be under the shade somewhere sleeping up for the day they do occupy open areas they need open areas the blackback jackal and the side stripe jackal are the two types of jackal we get here and well it seems that the the, the side stripe jackal is able to handle this kind of terrain and this kind of habitat a little a little bit better than the the blackback jackal we saw funny enough we saw a side striped jackal on the way in to work this morning on our morning commute. We also saw another wonderful thing. We saw a civet and the sun had already come up. Well, the sun was up but the mist rolling in. And we saw a civet that was hassling a pair of crowned plover coming in through Manuleti. We got a really nice view of it. Not very often you get to see that in daylight. But this is the kind of weather that you're likely to see nocturnal animals not going to bed too early. It might still be about. Ah, Brenda in Louisiana. Hello. That's what I was thinking what I was trying to get at earlier when I, when I started talking about vultures in the mist and why they are still hanging around. Thanks for the question, Brenda. A good question. And the reason primarily is with wet feathers, they've probably got quite, quite wet and damp feathers at the moment from precipitation overnight from the dew. And now with this mist, the energy that it's going to take to fly anywhere else right now is is probably or it's just going to take too much energy and if they wait a little while I think this is lifting I think that the sun's going to burn it open by the time we're at the end of drive and once the sun comes out and thermals start picking up with the thermal activity of the ground warming up they'll be able to move off and find find things a little bit further on morning boys Three little boys. Why are the rollers complaining? Here are rollers gathered. Oh, because one roller's got something that the other roller wants. Like a beetle or something. Yeah, it's going over. I think it might be a youngster, the way it's flying. Yeah, it wants. And now, sorry, it's gone. I don't know if you managed to follow today. Nothing. Uh, yeah, so the one adult flew into that little, I think it's a little piece of torchwood, little torchwood. And this is a juvenile that flew across now that's sitting up there. The adult had looked like a beetle in its beak. And the youngster was doing the usual youngster thing. 
talking with its mouth open wanting food even though it's flying and quite capable of catching things itself oh gosh look at that we've been asked before about tortoises and predators this looks like the hyena tracks here there's a tortoise that has been eaten poor child It actually had oh, I can't see it actually had the side of its shell crushed, uh, chewed open and its limbs chewed that was a hinchback tortoise there's a scarab beetle entering on the other side there's a few flies, no doubt even some of the carrion beetles will find it during the day very strange not often you see that actually somebody asked about tortoise predation what can eat them oh, jackal, hyena, lion, leopard if they can get their mouth around it Little head. Life and death in the African savanna is what it's all about, really. We, we often, in fact, most of the time, end of the time, we drive around and we have actually some wonderful moments with, with some of Africa's wonderful wildlife. But we must never forget the reality of it all, and that is that things have to be eaten. Everything that lives and moves and grows has to be eaten at some point. all got to be returned to the soil as food for everything else that has to live and grow plant and animal alike not always easy coming to terms with the things especially when they I don't know when they are kind of animals or when they sometimes some things are harder to bear than others and on every thing just as much right with just as much needs just as much uh, attention as it the bigger things, the big creatures into heart strings a little bit more than normal. So this is a very big dam I was talking about. We do don't we do sort of pick up signal issues here. We can't get to the water. We're not really allowed onto the property. But we can stop and have a look. I can see fish eagles. longer hearing any monkeys but that, as I said it was at least an hour ago that we came through the gate Ryan are you able to pick up oh, we've just had one fly past me now the wasps, two of them, they, oh, they suddenly had a fight, so they... Like try. <laughs> oh, there was one that was hovering around that hole. Here she's coming, come here, come here. Here's a giant spider wasp. What about that one? Come here. It's harder to follow a wasp than it is a bird. <laughs> oh, way harder. <laughs> <laughs> I think because there's another one. They're, they're spending a lot of time around that, that little tunnel there, which was originally a ventilation hole. And it's possible that... Oh, I wish I could... I was hoping she would land and you could see her.
These wasps are about two inches long. They're big, bright, metallic blue, metallic black. Spider hunting wasps. And one of their, one of their favorite spiders to hunt the big baboon spider, which is, I guess, our equivalent of our tarantula, or rather, our the tarantula. And the spider becomes food for their, for their larva, for their, for their baby. Maternal, maternal care or the maternal instinct in the wasp is from the wasps. The wasps are actually quite and they're very interesting creatures. But for some of the parasitic wasps that hunt prey, that only puts their prey to sleep, it doesn't kill their prey, it renders them. Thank you. Just talking about wasps. I don't know where I got lost with the wasp story and how much you you caught to that. Stripes that could have two front stripes on her on her shoulder. Split. Now we can't see it because she's turned away. Morning, could do. Question from across the planet. The other side of the planet, New South Wales, Georgie. Nice to have you on board with us. Our morning, your afternoon, no doubt. Georgie asked about impala bachelor herds. Are the bachelor herds made out of young males that are kicked out of the kicked out of herds? Yes, they are, Georgie. They you'll find Males of all different ages, in fact, not only the bat, the, the, the young boys, the, the yearlings, which are going on for a year now, or just over a year now. But the two-year-old, three and four and five-year-old males that may have come from the same herd, but there, there also will be males that have come in from different areas that will join up with the bachelor herd. But generally, you'll have a bunch of young males that have just left the family herd. Oh, well, there are leopard tracks heading back towards the dam, so that, that's quite interesting. Not very fresh tracks. I think we'll stay on Biffles of Cut Line for now. You can see this mist is going to be moving over. We're going to get much brighter skies shortly because it's clearing from the south. So I hope, Georgia, I hear there's some fires in us at the moment, the worst in 30 years or something. Although I didn't pick up where those fires are. Just bad news about the fires in Australia. The rutting season of Impala starts towards the end of April, I guess you could say our fall, our autumn, going into early winter, end of April going into May, and at the time that the, the, the rutting season starts, all the males within the immediate area, all the bachelors within the bachelor herds, have had to have sorted out their hierarchy because it, it will be disrupted somewhat with the acquisition of new males that are coming in, youngsters that have been uh, that are leaving the family groups or the, the, the breeding herds or the, the, the harems. And 
good males coming of age and wanting to challenge older rams. Between now and then there's going to be a lot of practice sparring, there's going to be a lot of posturing and a lot of work to sort out that hierarchy so that when the rut does start, the rams can, are going to know where they stand with each other and it'll be fairly easy for the dominant ram to, to take first charge of, take charge of a herd at first. And then subsequently he loses condition within the first two weeks of the rut and other rams will take over and these young rams that have been pushed out and are now part of these bachelor herds, they're going to be trying to get back to the family herd, pushed out of, sorry, pushed out of the breeding herds. They're going to be trying to get back to their mothers and the family. Dominant rams will be chasing them away again. So there's a lot of work for a dominant ram to do in the coming months. And fortunately, he's, being, he's going to be able to build up a lot of strength and he's going to be able to build up his fitness over the next couple of months so that when it does happen, he can take charge for a while. But it, it, it's such hard work that within a couple of weeks, he loses condition because he spends his days chasing females, mating with females but also chasing bachelors away, especially the youngsters, because where he's chasing youngsters on one side of the herd, there are going to be youngsters coming in on the other side of the herd. And, and he doesn't get time to eat, he doesn't get time to do much other than chase either males away or keep the females confined. Juvenile fish eagle, I think. Might be the one that we've seen at Juma Waterhole. That's it. I guess we could call that a sub adult. Starting to get its adult colours, so that's probably about seven or eight years old. Franklin complaining. There's a dam just on the other side of the fish eagle on Biffle's Hook. There's a little dam called Tamburti Pan. And previous offspring of Karula have spent a lot of time here, between here and Gauri Dam, Juma Waterhole. Franklin's complaining bitterly. I don't think it's because of the fish eagles. There might have been something at that dam. It's speaking of Gauri Dam or Juma Waterhole, let's take a ride down Ngubu Road towards the dam. Dave in Toronto. Morning Dave. Middle of the night for you in Toronto, no doubt. No hypoxis. Used to be hypoxis growing here. What are some of the rarer birds that we that we expect to see or we would like to see or rarer birds that occur here at Juma? And have I ever seen a Cory Busters? So, second question is easy enough. I have seen Cory Busted, but we're not going to see a Cory Busted here at Juma. 
biggest bustards that we have are the black bellied bustard and the red or the buff crested bustard or korhan. Quarry bustards require fairly large open grassland, much the same as the secretary bird or Stanley's bustard is another one. They are very big. In fact, the quarry bustard I think is the largest flighted bird in the world, if I'm not mistaken. Huge. But of course I haven't since not I've seen a quarry busted in other parts of Africa. Some of the rarer birds that we get here that we would that are, are special. Well I suppose there would be a variety. I'd have to sort of think through the bird book and I guess you could say there are two, ca two categories of they're birds that occur here that we see very seldom that we don't see very often because they're either very shy or because of the, the skulking nature that they tend to spend a lot of time in thick bush or those birds that are rather rare that might occur here that we hardly ever see things like a marina trogon which would probably be Pygmy Kingfisher, which we saw once a few days ago, maybe last week sometime. Marshall Eagle is one of them. Uh, some of the smaller raptors, the kestrels and falcons. Up in here, dwarf mongoose. Shouting at it. Grass is very long here, I'm not going to see them. Panic and grasses. What other birds? Some of the bush shrikes which are very pretty. I, I, I haven't heard the gorgeous bush shrike. They do tend to live on more permanent rivers. They're probably down on the sand in the Sabi River. It's probably better riparian habitat for the gorgeous bush shrike, but we do get the orange breasted bush shrike. We hear it very fairly often, we don't get to see it very often. Same with the grey-headed bush shrike. There is also a member of the shrike family are the chagras, the brown crowned and black crowned chagras. We hear them a lot. We don't get to see them. I know that uh, I think it's a brown crowned chagra that I need to find for Sharon in Austria. Beautiful call. Owls. Some of the owls, like the Scops owl and the barred owl and the wood owl, the owls that, that we hear sometimes but we hardly ever get to see them. We, I suppose, get to see the full spotted owl every now and then, and if we're lucky, the giant eagle owl and the spotted eagle owl. But yes, they wouldn't call them rare birds, I just call them birds that we don't see very often. And then of course there are migrants and there are a couple of waders and things that are quite rare. If we're going into the waders, a different type of bird entirely, they tend to be some of the longest distant migrants of some of the waders. The green shank and the rough and the reeve. I think the rough and the reeve are the only birds that the only bird in the country in the world that a different name depending on the sex. The male is a rough and the female is a reeve. others if I can as we're driving along.
news from FC via VM is that it looks like the hashtag Safari Live Twitter feed is down. So I think we're not getting anything in on Twitter this morning. Hashtag Safari Live. Somehow it has ceased to be. Oh, you had to fly away, didn't you? The red back strike. Carol Ann, Rapid City, asking if we have brown-headed parrot and we see brown-headed parrot. I guess that's another one, Carol Ann. There's, there's another bird, David. We hear the brown-headed parrots quite often. They're quite shy. But fortunately, they, their screech is unmistakable and quite loud. So if I hear one, we'll, be trying, we'll try our best to get, get to see it. They are social birds, so they're normally in little groups, twos and threes or four or five. Interesting now. There was a leopard here last night. I wonder where it went. I think we'll just have a quick look at the Juma waterhole. Hello, hippo. Too good time. Very peaceful here, Juma Waterhole, Gauri Dam, Juma Dam. Uh, what do we do? Do we go back? Do we go forward? Where do we go?
Central Road. It sounds like Twitter's working maybe. Julin. Julin on Twitter. Oh, somebody emailed it in from Twitter. Okay. The Twitter's not working, but it sounds like maybe it's working somewhere else. What is the difference between a wasp and a hornet? Ah, uh, a hornet is a type of wasp. We don't really get hornets here in Africa, in South Africa particularly. Elephant tracks. Hello elephant. Where did you go? I want you. I want to find you. Hornets are a type of social wasp that are similar to, I suppose we have some yellow jacket type wasps here. I think hornets and yellow jackets are, yellow jackets are just another name for hornets. And you get sort of giant hornets in Japan that are quite dangerous. Hippo and elephant was here. Both of them headed east. I think we'll just continue along with the direction we've been going in. Let's see if this elephant is still around. It's already left the road. Leopard tracks. Sunshine. Moss in Kentucky. Have I ever seen an African wild ass? Wild donkeys of Africa. Well, up in Kenya and East Africa, we call them punda. And yes, there are a lot of donkeys up there. Wild. But I think maybe you're thinking of talking about another um, another equine bring out next time I stop bring out my mammal book if you're referring to the same animal the donkey or the whether it, the African wild ass is a different animal
according to the radio, Ephraim is just here off to our right somewhere following leopard tracks, which must be the same leopard we saw, or the tracks that we saw coming this way from the waterhole, Gary Dam, which I'm guessing is the same leopard that was seen last night. And judged by the size of the tracks, it could very well be Mbula. So Ephraim is saying that it's down here on the other side into the donga, into the, the riverbed. Continue with Central Road all the way up to the cut line, or Drakensberg at least. Shouting on Yala North. Which means a cat could have come through here this morning. Somebody posted a picture of Mbula and Quarantine in this area. Oh, from Ephraim. Well, that's probably this Ephraim that's out there in the moment. Now I'm listening there. Franklin's complaining on the, on Yala Road North. Well, not a great signal. picture goes somewhere east of Buffalo Dam. Well, we're going to be coming around that way shortly. Good morning, Bill. Southgate in Michigan. I guess it's pretty cold in Southgate at the moment because I just know that Michigan, Illinois, those Midwest areas can be pretty cold this time of the year. Bill's asking if it would be dangerous if a person walked along these roadways at night. Well, pretty much so, Bill even for experienced guides, even for people who spend a lot of time walking around the bush. It's just it's suicide walking around at night. We don't have nocturnal vision. Uh, well, it's all very well that you might be walking with flashlights and things, but unfortunately the, the predators that see us during the day see us somewhat differently at night because we're so vulnerable at night. And I guess as humans we would be stumbling around a little bit in the dark and just our, our, our posture and our gait and everything about the way we might be walking would be a, might as well paint a big target on your back. But what makes it dangerous is that we can't really see what we're doing and you don't want to be walking into buffalo or elephant, let alone the predator. There's just things that you don't want to walk into at night. Now I have done so. I've uh, there have been times in my past where I've had to do things like that, but only in emergencies. There was a time once in my 20s when my Land Rover got stuck in the middle of nowhere. It was in the middle of the night. Nobody was on the radio. I couldn't raise anybody. It was long before cell phones were even a, a pipe dream. And 
I ended up having to walk back to camp and it was pouring with rain and lightning and the only thing that was lighting my way was actually the flashes of lightning because although it was full moon I wasn't getting much light out of the moon there was a huge thunderstorm all night But walking at night is just not a recommended thing. It's bad enough during the day for people who don't know what they're doing. You, you, you're already a target during the day. Your risk just trebles or increases exponentially at night. I have done night walks around camps just to see some of the nocturnal creatures, things that are not likely to be disturbed by light, mostly insects and spiders and some of the smaller creatures, bush babies. But I wouldn't really go out on foot at night at all. I think we have some more weather coming. Ants are building mounds, termites are building chimneys. south again. Three guesses what bird that's from. Uh. Texan just found the Kahumas up on Buffalo's up. In Kahumas. I like crested roller feather, I'm very lucky. The history of lilac crested roller feathers like this. Um, the 19th century when the so-called Great Trek was happening, the Oxwagon Convoys that came up from the Cape, especially going up into, uh, going up to the Gold Rush, up in the High South, traveling across vast distances of the, the Karoo and places like that. And the children would make toys out of animal bones, and when it came to growing up a little bit and 
sometimes youngsters would fall in love and a guy would give a lilac breasted roll of feather to his betrothed almost as an engagement gift almost like an engagement ring and that's why the name of the bird in Afrikaans is called a tropunt because a tropunt is like is an engagement ring it's a, it's a Where were we? Well, I was answering a question, I think, before I got disturbed by a feather. And the question was... I'll think of it. Sarah in California. That's what it was. Sarah in California. I think it's time to get out my mammal book. As soon as we get a nice long view down the cheetah cut line. Do we have any skunks or similar type animals? We do, indeed. We actually have, we have a, not quite skunks, but similar. I mean, we have the striped polecat, and we have an animal known as the zorilla. They are skunk-like. There he is, that broad-tailed paradise wider, look at him. Ladies have just flown away, he's still picking up some grass seed on the side of the road. Don't get my head in the way. There he is, landing now, going into the grasses. Stunning bird, grows his tail for the mating season. The mustelids. What is that? Is that a vehicle down there? Yeah. Top, your top left corner, you'll see it lurking. Up there? Yeah. Uh, He's just walking around. This is give it a bit of a... Yeah, but I don't want to smudge it against <laughs> the lens. Yeah, there we go. It's an aphid. Ah. Aphids are very interesting creatures. They are able to reproduce parthenogenetically and they are such incredibly well. They are such efficient reproducers that when an aphid is giving birth to her daughter, her daughter is already pregnant with her daughter. So it's sort of it's like those Russian dolls. An aphid inside an aphid inside an aphid. Mongoose, mongoose, mongoose. Then we get to the four-toed dog mongooses. Uh, then we're getting to hyenas. Hyena day, and then the viverids, the genet, and civet, and cats. Then we get to cats and odd fox. So where are the other? Ah, there we go. That is the zorilla. And this is the striped polecat. Well, that's the Libyan striped weasel, way up in North Africa. Um, but they are mustelids, which I'm sure, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the American skunk is also a mustelid. As opposed to the viverids, which are the mongoose. But those are our sort of skunk equivalents in Africa. And then of course there's the honey badger. 
just a little rattle. Oh wait, let's while we're at it, and I'm just waiting. There's a, there was a car down the road. And we have the the wild ass. No, okay, so different to the sort of the, the, the donkey that we get in in Africa. I haven't seen the wild ass. Not sure who it was that asked that question, but only way up in Ethiopia, Somalia, you don't get those anywhere else other than a couple of couple of spots up on the Horn of Africa. I suppose the 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 donkeys and the the wild donkeys that I see are probably just normal donkeys that have been brought to Africa. They're not they're more feral than anything else. Going back to the skunks and the, the Zorilla and the striped polecat, I've never seen a live individual. I've seen sometimes driving home at night at, up in the Timbavati something dash across the road in the distance, but never been able to see it very well at all. Oh, excuse me again. No, it's like this. It's a lot easier. My day for feathers. This is an interesting feather. This is a very interesting feather. This is from an owl, and it looks like it was possibly a juvenile, maybe e uh, spotted eagle owl. I'm not sure. It's a bit small for a giant eagle owl. But what makes it so interesting? I don't know if you can see this leading edge. Now this is the the left wing feather. This feather would be the one of the leading edge feathers on the tip of the wing. And what's interesting about our feathers is if you look at the, the actual leading edge of the, f the f of the feather, it's almost comb-like. It's not knitted as tight as, as all other bird feathers are that needs to create quite a tight seal in the top of the wing to help with, almost like an airplane's ailerons, help with lift and flight. But it's that tooth sort of comb-like structure at, the, at that part of the feather and as well as, I don't know if you can pick up the texture of this feather on camera, but it's it's a furry feather. It's a very very soft, very very furry furry feather. And the reason for that is that owls it gives owls silent flight at night. Um, most other large birds, any of the eagles and the vultures, when they're flying, even when they're soaring, there's an audible whistle or hum from their wings as the feathers vibrate uh, through the air. But for owls, they're gifted with silent flight. And it's that little comb-like structure and the furry, furry texture to the feather that gives an owl the ability to swoop down on unsuspecting little rodents who are pretty sensitive with their hearing as it is. So, today's my day for feathers. My Land Rover can wear that owl feather. Time to replace broken porcupine quill with the feather. Maybe Wendy can wear it. Warming up a bit.
Oh, okay. GJ in SoCal, Southern California. Wonder where you are in SoCal, GJ. Why do termites build chimneys in, in weather for weather coming? Well, a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is as ventilation shafts. So that the warm air that is being produced or that's being created by the termitivity, by the fungus gardens, the, the warm air that, that is generated by the colony um, can exit the colony and then other chimneys, other, other ventilation poles that suck fresh air in. And that's, that's kind of, it's air conditioning. It's quite efficient and very effective air conditioning. But also because if there's going to be a thunderstorm and if there's going to be weather, the termites want to release their reproductive case, the winged termites that need to fly. And it's almost impossible for them to fly from the flat ground. They need a slight launching pad. Even a small chimney is, is good enough. Different termite species build different types of chimneys. There's a very, very small termite that builds. It's sort of maybe a little bit thicker than a matchstick. It's a little tunnel with a, with, with a clay tube that stands probably about two or three inches high. Very, very delicate, but it's strong enough that the winged termites can climb up onto the top of that little chimney and then lift off and fly away. And the reason why it happens around rains is because they need the moist, they need the, first of all, they need the weather phenomenon to trigger the, the release of reproductors. We've already seen a couple of hatchings of, of termites. Well, not really hatchings, emerging of termites. But they all do it at different times of the year. And they all need to do it together because so many things eat the termites. It's probably one of the highest protein insects that emerge in such numbers. And because they're eaten by so many things, they have to be produced in such numbers to ensure at least a, a, a large number of them get to meet up with a mate and burrow underground and they need the rain, they need the wet weather to be able to get underground as soon as they can so they don't get eaten by reptiles. A couple of little bee eaters are they flown. Okay. So where in Southern California, GJ? Golf Juliet. I spent time in Aptos, just south of Monterey Bay, or rather south of Santa Cruz, just north of Monterey itself, on Monterey Bay. I think it was Brenda, if I'm not mistaken, who was a docent at Año Nuevo. Año Nuevo. The beach just near Half Moon Bay, I think it is, just north of Santa Cruz, that where all the elephant seals accumulate. I don't remember going there. A little bit of a battle going on up in the sky. We've had the sun trying to come out, but we've also had some heavy cloud moving in from the south. So there might even be rain. I'm looking at the southwestern part of the Sabi sand from this vantage point that we've got and it's looking pretty dark and rainy down there. So I'm thinking that maybe places like Leopard Hills, Ulusaba, Idube and Inyati uh, and Dulini, um, those camps down in the southwest, the southwest of us, I'm thinking they might be under drizzle right now. Uh, might not burn open, might not clear up. There we go, there's the Chagra calling. Hello Brian, in Toronto. Oops. This is my protein shake I'm drinking. I'm, I'm hungry, thirsty, hungry. Killed two birds with one stone. Food and liquid all in one but I'm dripping, so I'm making a mess. 
Brian in Toronto, are there any sable or roan antelope? Well, no. It's not really sable habitat, this. I guess there might have been in the past. The habitat has changed over the decades. And I'm sure there might have been in the past. But more further north in Kruger is where one will find roan and sable. And there are a lot of, just west of Kruger, there are a lot of private game ranches that breed, so mostly sable, not so much roan. where a couple of guys are looking at leopard tracks. listening to the radio updates from around the Sarbi Sand. Sounds like, sounds like a couple of guys looking for different leopards around. Well, there's Ephraim that's looking around Nyala Road South and there are a couple of guys on Torchwood looking for leopards. But so far only than Kahuma's up on Bifflesook. Look at all these <coughs> heliotropes. It's like a little carpet of heliotropium interspersed with the blue comelinas, there's a bit of wild foxglove coming up. You can see the odd little pink flower, which is a wild foxglove, and most of this white this is all heliotropium, which is also known as the row of stars, or row of stars, yeah. Here's a wild fox glove. And you get a darker pink variety that's known as that's a sesamosum. Sorry. Take me away from the flower.
Hello Janine. Janine's in Washington. I wonder if that's Washington State or Washington DC. Janine wants to know if there have been any cheetah sightings of late nearby. As far as I know they have, up on Bottles, they've been excuse me, there have been two cheetah that have been seen up there occasionally. And I've been hoping that they'd come our way. They're not really any good cheetah ha habitat. Except for quarantine area and going up onto Zoe's Road where we have seen cheetah before. There are areas where cheetah will cross through, not areas where cheetah will stay. Cheetah really don't stay still for very long. They're constantly on the move. They have very large areas that they roam in and they throughout the areas that they that they live in they have particular open areas where they will hunt and, and will use for hunting. So although we might even have cheetah that move through a place like this, this is an ideal habitat for them to hunt. Not to say that they won't because I've seen cheetah hunting in this kind of habitat because being a cat, being a predator they are opportunists. Different soil types have different grass types. But I'd say, if you know your grasses, the Aerogrostus family of grasses, the love grasses. Aerogrostus is, comes from the Greek words eros and grastis, which are the love grasses. And the panicums, which are panicums. The highly palatable grass, you get the Rhodes grasses on the termite mounds. As you can see, this termite mound, there's a very specific grass, this grass that only grows on termite mounds. Um, often you get a like a, a lemon smell to it, not quite lemon grass. So depending on whether it's a sand felt or it's clay, if it's sour felt or sweet felt, different grasses dominate different soil types and different grasses require different have different requirements. And there's a Thamida triandra we just passed, which is not a very palatable grass. There's some grasses that favor di disturbed areas. They tend to be, have, have a low palatability. They're not very, very palatable. Welcome back. Hopefully sound is back. We seem to have lost sound. We had to reboot there for a minute. As we approach Buffles of Dam.
Morning, Bob. Bob is in Virginia Beach. The lack of antelope, is it because of the full moon or is it because of the weather? I think it's because of the weather, Bob. Not I think, but yeah. <laughs> it's a weather thing. Changes in atmospheric pressure that have animals doing different things. something sooner or later. But judging by the chatter on the radio, it seems to be quite widespread this lack of animal activity. I suppose Bob could have something to do with the full moon. The fact that things are a lot more active. Times of full moon because even some of the not the diurnal animals that will be active during night on a full moon. I've seen cheetah hunting on a full moon. Wild dog get pretty active during the night on a full moon. Of course, the weather and the moon is no coincidence given that full moons and new moons do have higher, well, there's a higher chance of, of, of weather changes at full moon and new moon. Oops, sorry. Let's see if the cheetah are walking up or down, cheetah cut, cheetah cut line or riffles of cut line. We visit Buffalo's of cut line often enough. We might catch it today one day. They do move along that road. There are some big open areas on Buffalo, which is where the cheetah do tend to spend a lot of time. What did I just see? A big tree stump. Sleeping tree stump. Dayton. Dayton is Ohio, is it not? Pamela. I think it's Pamela. Dayton. Oh, made a mistake. Millie in Cleveland. Ah, oh, Millie. Oh, I'm confused. <laughs> Pamela in Dayton or Millie in Cleveland? that Millie? The Millie Arno in Cleveland, I think. Okay, let's go for that again. Tell me, tell me, tell me. Somebody doesn't believe this is live. A oh, Millie in Cleveland saying Pamela in Dayton, the daughter. Millie's daughter doesn't believe this is live. Well, how can I prove to you it's live? I can't give you a newspaper. I can show you the calendar of my clock. My but yeah, ask a question and remind me I should switch this off. Um, put it on aeroplane. But there, 
7.37 a.m. Tuesday the 6th of January. That's what it is on my phone. I remember often having these questions about people not really being sh Deborah in Arizona. Deb. Deborah, Deborah, Deb, yep. Arizona. How do we get our fuel? I at the moment, like I did a fuel run yesterday, we have a bunch of jerry cans and we head out to Kluvakani, which is the closest little village to us outside of Manjaleti. And it's in Kluvakani that we fill up. I filled up yesterday with all the jerry cans. And we do, we're running it sort of virtually a jerry can a day for each vehicle. 20 litre. Yeah. I've had mosquitoes biting my feet and they are itching. What have we got on the road? Nothing yet. In the past, I've actually seen cheetah right here a few times. With this. There's a fire break that runs up into Biffles of this road that we're going past now. That runs into big open area so I have had cheetah coming down from up there from the north as well as from the east on Torchwood using this road and it's a matter of timing being here when they're here or knowing that they're here unless somebody drives here they couldn't even know it The elephant tracks crossing to the north here. I wonder if it's the same bull whose tracks I found earlier today. But I seem to lose track of where he went. And that could have been his. tracks, tortoise tracks, dark skies, look at that dark sky, here we've got sunshine and looking down to the south, look how dark that is over the Sahabi sand, there's another lily just about to bloom Take my fleece off. Hot when the what? I say taking a chance. <laughs> yeah. It's hot because the sun comes out, but it's nothing is gonna be out for very long. It's pouring with rain in the western the western sector of the Sabi sand. Looking quite wet down there. See we will we'll get an open gap shortly. Soon enough.
<laughs> yeah, a good point, right? Only problem is we're in the northeastern <laughs> corner. It's the only way we can go is south and west. But uh, wow, weather's really closed in from going all south and west. If you zoom past that that marula tree down the road, you can look into the rain in the distance, looking south deep into the sabi sand. Termine Mound. Well, this is a recently added to the old mound, sort of the rem, probably the remnants of the original colony. And Amanda in Alabama was asking Alabama about the soil. What is the soil around the termite mound like? Well, it largely depends on the species of termite, but it also depends on the soil type itself. We are on quite sandy soils here. So fairly large grains of, of what we would suppose you could call a decomposed granite. And the soil is, is, is glued together by the, the byproduct of what termites do. And um, the radio interrupting me. And the that sort of it's, it's like a clay type of substance that is used to glue the sand together that gives it that appearance that makes it look like cement and it is exceptionally durable in fact for many many years for decades in fact termite mounds were oh there's a hypoxis termite mounds were broken up and used for tennis courts clay courts that is pretty that yellow. Looks like our boxes. I need to just get a quick photo of that. Excuse me. Please be patient with me with flowers. Switching between the blue and the yellow, or okay. the violet and the yellow.
No good. Well, the flesh just blows it out. And I can't see if I'm getting it focused or not because it's such fine focus with this little macro thing that fits on the end that moving in a millimeter each way takes it in and out of focus but we'll see if I can get it and if I can get to the few flowers that I've been photographing over the last few days I still haven't taken them off the camera and started looking at what they are problem is that I leave my books here and a day like yesterday when I was up at at um, Manileti all day waiting for a mechanic who never arrived I didn't have any of my books to be able to go through any of the flowers but I'm trying to do it today because there have been now I think there are at least four or five flowers that I'm not too sure about This is the book that Janine was saying she left at home. Janine in Hoodsprite. Orchids. Uh, Gladiola. Seraphita. There we go. That is. Hypoxus rigidula. Rigidula. One of these, Hypoxus. One of the hypoxus flowers, oh, these are paintings, so it's a little bit difficult to see the paintings. You might find a photograph in one of my other books, but that, that is a, one of the hypoxus. And the hypoxus is actually, um, also known as star lilies, but they're also a, the, 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 the tuber, the, the bulb of the, it's not a bulb, it's like a tuber. Potato like, it's called wild potato. And it supposedly has numerous medicinal properties. Although I'm not too sure which. I do remember when I was when I was trying all sorts of things to to delay the, the, the decline of my kidneys. I was trying a bunch of homeopathic things and one of the things that I did try was a concoction made out of the wild potato, the hypoxis. But um, just not a very common flower, not a common plant to find, especially if you, you don't see it unless it's flowering because the leaves are thin and tall, blade like blades of grass really. Unless they're flowering, I don't, I don't get to see them much. But a vivid bright yellow, really bright yellow. One thing I'm going to try in two days time when I come back from drive or rather come back on drive in two days time I'm going to bring a thermometer and with the termites opening their vent holes and opening their chimneys and do an experiment that will be quite interesting is to measure the, the, the temperature outside the mound and then just drop the thermometer in a little bit with a piece of string because unfortunately you can't, all you'd have to do is really just hold your hand over the top and you can feel warm air coming out. But termites have to have a constant 30, around about 37, 38 degrees Celsius, almost like our, our bodies. It's vital that they maintain that temperature. And I think we need to start heading a little bit west because we are right on the eastern boundary, as the weather's moving in, we don't want to be caught too far away if it does decide to, to close in on us. Just 
thinking which way we should go. I think we should go back to Lear Road. We pretty much exhausted the roads in the northeastern corner from Central Road. Ephraim has been on Yala Road. Mel. Hello, honey. Mel, California. It's a twisted bar, but I hope it stays there. It's in that little bit. That is gone. See, birds, they're fine if you just drive past, they'll stay there. But as soon as you stop and you even begin to reverse or look at them, they fly away. Mel in California was asking if there are any archaeological sites in the area. Not in this immediate area. There, there, there is history of humans using this area. Occasionally one finds broken stone tools, art of the odd artifact, but that's just from nomadic people moving through the area, hunter-gatherers in the past. One of the major archaeological sites is a little bit north of here, uh, a place called Mapungubwe. M-A-P-U-N-G-U-B-W-E, Mapungubwe. And that is, Pungubwe is one of the, oh, that's a, just a very significant site in the in Venda, the Venda people. It was a place where gold plated, a very famous gold plated rhino was found. I think it was a wooden rhino co coated in gold, coated with, with, with gold plate over it, that dated back long. I mean, it, it's somehow connected to the, to the big wall, this big stone structures in, in Zimbabwe and a lot of that is connected to further south of us we have other very significant archaeological sites, the place called Adam's Calendar, in fact it's, some, it's, it's sort of the South African equivalent of Stonehenge because of the, the stones that are so strategically placed with solstices and aligned with uh, the stars of Orion and that sort of thing. So there are, but as far south as Adam's calendar is, that's how far Mapungubwe is in the north. So in the immediate vicinity, not much. In Kruger, there are a bunch of archaeological sites in Kruger, and a friend of mine actually wrote a new guidebook, a guide to the archaeological sites. Sadly, he passed away just after the book was published. But someone who was been in the safari business for well over 30 years, a chap by the name of Garth McFarlane. I remember picking up the stone one day on drive, that was quite clearly a worked stone. It had obviously been washed out or, or it was on the road, so it might have been embedded in the road at one stage and with the vehicles going it had sort of actually been brought to the surface and, and was lying loose. Hello Jeffrey. Are there any animals here that I dislike? Other than mosquitoes of course. Any are there any animals here that I dislike or feel malice towards? Is that what it was? No Jeffrey. Other than other than things that bite, like mosquitoes and tsetse flies. Not that I dislike them. They've got every right to be around as we have, as everything else. But, 
you bite me, you die. If a wasp stings me, that's fine. That's a different story because it's not doing anything other than protecting itself. It's never kill a wasp. I save wasps. I'm constantly getting wasps out of buildings because they fly in to make nests. We're rescuing them out of ponds or swimming pools. Uh, bees too. Bees are very special. But yeah, if a mosquito is biting me, I am going to squash it, if I can, if I'm quick enough. And if there's another type of biting fly that's going to bite me, I will feed it to a spider. It's just, it's just... Self-defense. Especially if a tiny little mosquito has the potential to kill me. I think I have a pretty strong case for self-defense. But other than that, I can't think of, no, there's nothing, absolutely nothing that I dislike. Yeah. Uh, nature to me is an absolute wonder, every little living thing. There's some things that can be irritating. Tiny little ants that get into the honey or um, the Argentinian roving ants that it seemed to have taken over most of Africa. They are a little bit of a pain in the feet because, well, just because of their habits, they bite. Crazy ants. And those tiny little flies that hang around the buffalo when they when you're sitting sometimes on a hot day and sitting near buffalo, those little flies get into the corner of your eyes and then you up your nose and they can be a little irritating. The one thing I suppose you could say I do despise. And that would be the humans that mistreat nature, the humans that do venture into nature and have no respect for it. I guess that doesn't count, really. There was a leopard drinking here. Clancy, nice to hear from you. Clancy in a Columbus, Ohio. Let's go this way. Do we have any animals that hibernate like bears? Not really, Clancy. We do have a, we do have some things that are dormant in our dry season in our winter, but of course. Our dry season or our winter is very mild, so there are some that might be they might be dormant, but they they will and could be active if if the weather changes or if they need to. You know, for all, for example, all the reptiles and you still see snakes, and see lizards and things moving around. But as long as the conditions are optimal, there are. The, the term that we use for, for, for that is estivation. Well, estivation is generally a sort of a term used for animals that tend to become dormant in the summer as opposed to the winter. But no, we don't have, we don't have any animals, large animals that hibernate. We don't get snow, so we don't get the conditions that require animals to burrow down and stay hidden. And all the animals that we do have in Africa need to be eating every day.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Paranoid Franklin. Really almost nothing moving around today. Too bad. The sky's lifted a little bit, it's not as dark as it was. I didn't get that. Are there any what? Oh, mineral deposits. Louisville, Kentucky. Asha. Referring to kimberlite. <laughs> no kimberlite here. Mineral deposits around Juma. Well, no, not really. A little bit further north from here. Where I am, I mean, back home for me, there is vast deposits of mica and then of course there's the big mine up in hello guinea fowl please and Palabora is a huge open cast mine for magnetite there are around the Salati game reserve there are some old emerald mines kimberlite is, is, is a very specific type of or I guess you could call it or, 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 or geological feature that produces diamonds. We don't have that yet. I guess it's kind of lucky there aren't any mineral deposits here, or mineral yeah, deposits of this. Because otherwise, the bush wouldn't be here. Magnetite has become such a commodity that the mine in Palabora has expanded. I mean, you, you look at the mine in Palabora on Google Earth, it's a, it's a giant gaping hole. And of course, everything that's out of that hole, it just swallows up the felt on the sides of it. It's unbelievable. And then of course there's all the trucks that carry the ore that are just destroying the roads. So it the economy of the country at work. But here the commodity is wildlife. And that too drives the country's economy because of the tourism and the, the revenues that tourism generates make it a sustainable form of income. Far better than any alternative use of, of, of wildlife, which of course the alternative is something not many of us agree with. side of things which while it does generate huge influxes of cash in the short term it's just not sustainable that's just downright not right Morning Cindy, Cindy wants to know where the Ellies are. Well we've had a couple of tracks in the end. We had a couple of elephant two days ago. I think Scott might have seen elephant yesterday. Um, I can't answer 
I can't answer you where they are because if I knew where they are, I'd try and find them. But they just clearly are not on Juma at the moment. Or they might be. We just haven't covered all of Juma. There are still parts of Juma that we have to get to. And we can cross over to Arethusa as well for a little while. Maybe with this weather, maybe those jackal will be on the airstrip. Oops. Wow, treehouse is starting to build up with this algae. Need some pachyderm to come st stir up some of the water and get ox get oxygen going in it. But uh, it's not an easy question to answer. Where are the elephants? They're everywhere. They 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 are a lot of elephants in Kruger. But we're a tiny little postage stamp size of ground in the whole of Kruger and. For the moment, there haven't been any elephant where we've been looking. There have been elephant tracks. There were elephant tracks heading away from Juma Waterhole from last night. There were elephant tracks heading northwest from where we had the lion kill the buffalo. That would have been yesterday. And we could come around a bend and find an elephant at any moment. See, elephants move over such vast areas that we just, it's a very lucky thing to be able to be with them on Juma because it's only a brief time that they will be on Juma before they cross over the boundaries again. So it's a matter of, once again, it's a matter of being in the right place. Oops at the right time. How many times we drive on a road, any of the roads that we've been doing all morning and there could very well have been a leopard that came onto the road behind us or might have just left the road before we get to a particular spot. And much like it was two days ago when we came here and suddenly there was a leopard but that was because our timing was perfect to be able to co meet up with us. Kind of the same thing with it, well, with, with everything. But it would seem that most of the animals are not moving around very much in the last 12 to 24 hours. They have very, very few tracks on the road itself for whatever reason. get that right, my mind was elsewhere, but Mickey, North Carolina, I think it's Asheville, North Carolina, asking about the winters, do animals migrate? There's no migration here in, 
in, in this part of the world, Mickey. There is such seasonal utilization of different areas. Migration is when you get masses of the same species moving together. Here they don't accumulate. We don't have the space for it. We don't have the open plains that, that allow the animals to accumulate in large groups. That's why we see only small family groups of wildebeest and zebra and they're always associated with some little open patch of land somewhere. Uh, open patch of ground rather, some grassland areas. Um, temperatures during the day can be very similar to summers, maybe not as hot, so you can still get 30 degrees Celsius days with temperatures into the 80s in daytime temperatures in winter and then it drops down to maybe the very lowest 5 degrees Celsius which is probably low 40, mid 40s I think somewhere around there in Fahrenheit Also, I think the question earlier, there was a question about the altitude, average altitude here. It's around about a thousand feet. We're averaging 300, 350 meters above sea level. Arathus has got. We're not going to go too far. And I'd like to maybe go and have a look up on the airstrip at Arathus and this kind of weather. We might see those jackal. I think there is also misguided ecotourism. Um, I 
there are places that are that, that, that operate under the guise of ecotourism but they're actually they are I wouldn't say damaged, but they just they're, they're, they're not contributing anything, they're detracting from it. Uh, places where that, that are supposedly animal rehabilitation centers or, or uh, breeding centers, but they, all they really do is they rely on tourism for people to come in and photograph themselves with the lion cub or something. And I'm, I'm appalled at that kind of thing because poor lion cubs that get manhandled by children and adults alike day in and day out hand reared lion and then well I won't go on what happens to them later on but there are some places that are just too big with far too many vehicles such a small place and sometimes it's maybe small small reserves that are self-contained that might have too many vehicles and too many lodges um, but yes high impact tourism is exactly that it's high impact it, it eventually leads to destroying the very thing that it's there to save the very thing that it's there to try and conserve a piece of paper in the road I'm trying to get. I should have a stick that I can just poke and pick it up. Debra <laughs> seems the the lion are ordering out these days. That's a packaging label from South African Airways. Must have fallen off someone's luggage, although it's showing that it's meat, fish vegetable and fruit. Anyways, maybe it fell out of the sky off of an aeroplane. Was that Deborah wanting to know if, if one wanted to do a safari, can you pri hire a private guide like myself? Yes, you can. Of course, it largely depends on where you want to go on safari. But yes, there are private guides. Um, I, I do freelance myself. Um, and I'm always able to accompany anybody who wants to go on safari especially up in East Africa since I spent a lot of time there and I know the language and the people and to go to and I really actually have to start working a little bit more and building a website and getting my name up there because I don't have enough work during the year to keep me busy I need a lot more I'm not too fond of guiding in these areas because even if I was to bring a group here it would still require us to go out with one of the lodge vehicles or one of the lodge guards and although people do do that 
uh, particularly because some of the guides are not that great. They're just Land Rover jockeys. And sorry to say that, but the uh, industry has become so big that there are guys that just come into the bush for a few months or a year or so just to have some fun and then go back to the city and their hearts are not in it. They just want to be in it something alternative for a while before they go and settle down with family in the city. But there are a bunch of private guides and freelance guides that run their own operations. Scotty is one of them as well. Scotty, Scott has Scotty D Safaris. Um, I have a bunch of friends who I freelance with because they have a company that sometimes there's overflow that, and they'll call me in to help out. And especially for the viewers, and then of course there's uh, on track safaris, which is Will's company. I uh, can always maybe make a plan through Will if people like, as has happened in the past, people are coming through on safari with the foxes. And I can join you for a try and join you if I can. But personally, I'd like to be taking my own safaris, I'd like to be able to book trips for people anywhere in Africa and take groups, take a group of eight to ten people, you're always going to have enough discount wherever you go that the guide and the tour leader or the group leader will be able to, their accommodation will sort of be covered by the discount you get in, in, in group, not group booking. Here we are, wonderful big open area. This is an airstrip that is quite active with things at times. Mostly it's where all the people fly into when they're going to the different lodges. There will be something out here on the airstrip today. with us and around us probably because of the insects that might be disturbed elephant elephant we got to catch an elephant before the end of drive oh, so pleased he looks like a massive bull gosh he's huge and he's out in the open and it's oh this is beautiful patience pays off Thank you everyone for your patience with flowers and ramblings. Hello birds, crown plovers, blacksmith lapwings. 
and lesser black lesser black wing lap wing lesser black wing oh he's a fantastic bull wow see the jackal but then I've only had eyes for elephant because we've been driving most of the way up here but I would have seen them I'm sure unless they were lying down in the grasses oh he's just a magic Ellie this I'm in parlor running off into the tree line started getting a little bit upset about our approach so I just stopped because he lifted his head we'll let him get used to us he is in must so and he is going to come towards us I think he's a collared bull he's one of the collared bulls mm -hmm. I'm trying to think who he could be he's, I'm not even sure if I know him he might be I need to look at my my Ellie photos from home to see if he isn't maybe one that I see up at home. Savetheelephants.org. He's going to come straight towards us. There's the jackal. He's, they're running away from him. He's I can't smell him yet, the wind's blowing wrong. What's on his head? He's got a twig or something on his forehead. Apart from, maybe it's not collared. Maybe that's just mud on the top of his, the back of his head that I was thinking was a, a transmitter device. Yeah, it is it's just a clump of grass that he's thrown in. <laughs> I just saw that lump. Often with the with the collared bulls, you can or collared ellies, backing device. The actual mechanism is right there above the shoulders. Jumbo Bona. Yeah, I'm coming to say hello. Hello, big boy. He is an incredible elephant. In full must. Now we're getting the whiff of it. Now we're I'd like to be able to turn around, but it might disturb him. Wait till he moves off first. I'm a little slow in getting my toy out of my pocket. photographing me, he's supposed to be photographing. I can't reach. <laughs> well, I can't resist. I can't resist taking a photograph. Turn around, you can see him better. I suppose I could turn around there where the plane turns around.
or twos and now they might be interested in it. And Ah, Tyson's one more than glove on the A-strip. Oops. Him walking down the road, I don't want to get too close behind him because he is. Look at him, he's got an attitude now. Phew, it's a very strong smell. Full must elephant is something else to be, especially this guy this size. What else he do? Maybe I'll go to the little pan, buffalo pan. And I guess the jackal all ran, both ran off. Yeah, a lot of sedges that he's eating, and also pulling out a lot. He's not really shaking off the roots. I'm thinking he's actually just going to be biting off all the roots because he's, he's positioning the grass in his mouth that all the roots stick out to the the right side here. I don't, I we'll see if he's yeah. But he just chews off the roots. It's funny because in the You'll notice that in the dry season, they're going to be eating the roots, shaking all the sand off the roots and eating the roots as opposed to the wet season now. And there's a lot of this is sedge, He's picking up a lot of the sedge grasses as well. Positioning them in his mouth that the roots all hang out on the side and then he's chewing on the leaves and then just biting off all the... There's not even, doesn't need to bother shaking the sand off of the roots, he's not even swallowing them. Morning, Ozzy, sister Lisa. Lisa is asking if I'm ever, I don't know, what's it, is it nervous? If I'm ever affected being around elephant um, after having an encounter with one. But that was a long time ago, Lisa. That was 17, 18 years ago now. 
17 and a half years ago. There's a plastic water bottle behind me, but I can't get it because I can't get out of the car. I do, I am able to read. I think I've seen thousands of elephants since then. I've spent since now, that was in 97, I think it was, back in Sulu, that I had an incident with an elephant. And, well, if, if anything, it did, it did bring home one vital point, and that is that one can't get complacent. And I never like to be able to come across that I am complacent in their company, because they are big, bulky, very strong things. There's a comble duck flying around the pan. Um, but I do, over the years, uh, even before the incident and I suppose to a large extent after the incident that I had with an Ellie, basically I was underneath an elephant for some time and she was mauling me and she gored me with her tusk. But that's another story for another day. He's making his way to, I think he might be making his way to the pond. What I'm going to do is move off this other Arethusa vehicle, come past so that his guests can have a view. Um, I should. But as much as one is able to read their body language, they are still very much thinking, feeling, emotional beings. Elephant on a mission. Yep, here we go. Turning down to. Are you going to go to the mud wallow, Boyki? Please, please go left. That way. Yeah, that way. No, that way. Now he goes left. Okay, this might be interesting. He's now making his way to the pond. This is scared of elephants. Why you go in front of him like that? I don't know. Yes. Some guides just don't know how to treat these animals. Oh, he'll go to another mud wallow. Unfortunately, that vehicle sort of cut right in front of him and turned him around from going, prevented him from going to the wallow, to the pond.
And that's why elephants sometimes get a little bit upset with vehicles. This guy's asking for this elephant to He's actually heading, if he carries on this direction that he's going now, he's actually going to be going on to Juma at some point later this morning. Being an airstrip, we can't cross it over there. He's going on a road that's actually been closed off. We could probably go around if he's going to follow that road, we might, but it's going to be a little bit late as we're reaching the end of drive. So we're going to just instead watch him as he moves into the, into the tree line. Goodbye, Ellie. We'll see you on Juma this afternoon, maybe, if we're lucky. Mm. Straight beeline for Gary Dam. Be there in about an hour or two. <laughs> Wonderful that we were able to catch something like that at the end of drive. It has been a, a little bit slow earlier on, as far as animal movement is concerned. But a lovely weather for flowers. And it's really nice and pleasant with this little bit of cloud cover. So, he's heading up north. He's sort of heading up in a sort of northeasterly direction. There's a good chance that he's heading towards family groups. He might be in touch with them. You know, elephants vocalize over very long distances. And the fact that he is pretty much on a mission, he's been heading in one direction, could indicate that he's made contact and he's talking to a few so thanks for joining us. My name is Mark, Brian on camera with the thumb and Viam in final control from all of us here at Wild Earth. Let's see if we can find him later. Join us again this afternoon. Bye everybody. Bye.